record. All right, there we go. We are recording. All right, so uh, Stephen's going to kick us off. Uh, we will, oh, I should say we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Just for sake of the flow of the presentation, we'll maybe ask that you write those down and uh, bring them to us at the end. Uh, does that sound okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, Stephen is going to kick us off here. All right. Thank you. So contemporary evidence about King Harold Fairhair, which is from the late ninth century, comes from his entourage of poets who were called Skald in Old Norse. In the words of Bruce Lincoln, who wrote a wonderful but somewhat expensive book on this subject, they were his propaganda corps. But to speak of them with those terms alone would be an injustice, I think, to their actual reputation in Norse society, because they weren't actually just hired goons mis uh, spreading misleading information. Their craft actually required incredible skill, as Joshua will tell of us later, and the importance of words, especially when skillfully sown, in shaping reputations cannot be understated. The key to power and prestige in the medieval North was more or less a matter of public perception. This meant that poetry was a precious commodity in North society because it could either enhance a person's reputation or utterly destroy it. For instance, a scald might praise a person's valor in battle, claiming that they had Odin's blessing for victory and slew many of their foes without breaking a sweat. The result would be an image of a courageous warrior who ought not to be lightly challenged. Yet, a scald could also slander a person, asserting that they were bested by their foe in an embarrassing or shameful way. This would therefore have the opposite effect, painting their foe as the heroic leader instead. What made their poetry even more significant, though, was its connection to a specific occasion. Scalds acted as supposedly first-hand witnesses to great events, and it was part of their job to relay those events for others to hear. The results partially depended, rather cynically, upon who was giving them more coin, but also to protect themselves from potentially life-threatening wrath. Scalds thus recorded historical events, but often colored them to best suit their patrons. In other words, their poetry was less about recording history as an unbiased, uninvolved party but rather about influencing public memory about an event and thus shaping the perception of the people it concerned. Yet we should not be overly dismissive of the credibility of their work because it would have been an insult to attribute exploits to a king in front of other witnesses that he did not actually undertake. Thus, there was a social responsibility for scalds to preserve events for the sake of communal memory. They did not therefore invent material Instead, they emphasized the praiseworthy features of a given event by highlighting favorable exploits that they witnessed rather than inventing them altogether. Now, as the keepers of history and distributors of fame and folly in Norse society, scalds were actually granted great social prestige. Chieftains and kings gave them gifts such as golden arm rings to reward them for their praise, but also to ensure their continued good grace. Although it might be a risky move, scalds could slander their patrons just as easily as they praised them. But King Harold avoided such a fate by being particularly generous to his scalds. As it is said in chapter eight of Egil's saga, quote, of all his followers, the king held his poets in highest regard and let them sit on the bench opposite of the high seat, end quote. Now, seating arra arrangements are nothing to laugh at here for they were often the catalyst for deadly feuds between Norse families. So in return for such lavish gifts and respectable seating, his skaldic retinue delivered because their praise-filled poetry circulated far and wide. According to the 13th century Icenic historian Snorri Sturluson, who we will discuss about in more detail quite a bit throughout this presentation, quote, there were skalds with King Harold and people still know their poems, and likewise all other poetries about all other kings who have ruled Norway since." End quote. So that's great, but we still have a problem. Their poetry was part of an oral tradition, which means that it wasn't actually written down or preserved as a text until much later through Christianization. Generally speaking, this oral tradition can therefore only be studied through later written literature 
that either claims to rely upon such poetry as source material or quotes it directly. Yet this means that the already fluid poetry of those scalds, which never completely served as an unbiased history in the first place, is presented to us through yet more filters, the memory and the politics of later authors and their audiences. So, although we should prefer sources that are contemporary, or at least near contemporary, with the events in question, we don't actually have that poetry until it was written down and incorporated into later historical writing. And what's more, most of that later writing doesn't even come from Norway. Instead, most of it comes from Iceland, for reasons that we'll discuss in more detail later. Our most detailed source concerning his life, reign, and death then comes three and a half centuries later in a 13th century collection of prose narratives about Norwegian kings called Heimskringla, written by the Icelandic politi politician and historian Snorri Sturluson. In the prologue of his work, however, Snorri tells us, albeit somewhat vaguely, what his sources supposedly were when preparing this work, claiming and frequently quoting skaldic poetry as a primary source. As he puts it, quote, some is written according to old poems or narrative songs which people used to use for their entertainment. And although we do not know how true they are, we know of cases where learned men of old have taken such things to be true, end quote. And then just a short while later, he continues saying, quote, we have mostly used as evidence what is said in those poems that were recited before the rulers themselves or their sons. We regard as true everything that is found in those poems about their expeditions and battles. It is indeed the habit of poets to praise most highly the one in whose presence they are at the time, but no one would dare to tell him to his face about deeds of his which all who listened, as well as the man himself, knew were falsehoods and fictions. That would be mockery and not praise." End quote. Thus, Snorri acknowledges that the, their potential shortcomings of skaldic poetry, yet knew well that such an art embodied a delicate balance between real history and catered praise. This is all the more true considering that it was also Snorri who wrote the Prose Edda, which was a guidebook for aspiring 13th century skalds. In other words, he was intimately familiar with the art. So considering all of this, the reliance on skaldic poetry as a source for this work can be seen on nearly every page of Heimskringla, as it is frequently quoted. Yet Snorri isn't actually the first person to have done this, for his fellow historians had already been substantiating their accounts by quoting a contemporary skald as evidence, though it seems that Snorri was more discriminating and systematic than his predecessors. On that note though, at least three Icelandic historical surveys of Norwegian kings actually do come before Heimskringla, both from the late 12th century and early 13th. But Snorri's work seems to have been the best, which isn't surprising if it's seen as a culmination of Icelandic historical work. In fact, it seems that virtually all writing of new sagas about Norwegian kings stopped after Heimskringla. The trend in the 14th century, at least, was supplementing Heimskringla with more material rather than producing a replacement. But no matter how good a historian's work is, the historian is always a product of their own time, place, and position in life. Snorri was first and foremost an Icelander rather than a Norwegian. And although his ancestry certainly had roots in Norway, his attitudes about Norway and especially its politics were seen by him through an Icelandic lens. In the 13th century, Iceland had been an independent country governed by assemblies rather than kings for over 300 years. And their own founding story features proud independent landholders boldly leaving Norway for faraway lands in light of King Harold's attempts to unify it under his sole control. Yet in Snorri's time, a handful of powerful families descended from those fleeing landhold landholders 
violently competed for political prominence in Iceland. And what's more, Snorri was himself one of Iceland's most prominent political figures and a member of its most powerful family, the Sturlungs. He was therefore directly involved in politics, which included a few visits to Norway, wherein he had hoped to win the favor of the Norwegian royal court. I'd like to dwell on this point for a moment. In the spring of 1220, there was a bloody altercation between the Norwegians living in Bergen and some Icelanders. This conflict nearly threatened war between Norway and Iceland, but Snorri, who was in Norway at the time, seems to have quelled those tensions by promising to persuade his fellow Icelanders to accept Norwegian overlordship peacefully. For that was an ambition, peaceful or not, pursued by many Norwegian kings at this time. For this deed, and much else, including some flattering poetry, Snorri was rewarded by the Norwegian court, which included fancy titles and lordly gifts. Upon returning home, however, Snorri showed no interest in keeping his promise, perhaps because he himself had no interest in giving Icelandic independence up. Yet, after a falling out with his own family, Snorri returned to Norway, possibly hoping to use his connections to regain his lost property in honor back at home. Things soon got messy though, when Snorri ended up on the wrong side of a rebellion against a Norwegian king and then defied the king's ban on travel from there to Iceland. It wasn't long after returning home then that Snorri met his not so glamorous end in a cellar at his home in Reykjaholt. My point in this digression though, is to show just how ambiguous Snorri's own relationship with Norway was in his political life, and to emphasize that such a relationship inevitably influenced his work. As a powerful independent Icelandic chieftain, he both schmoozed and snubbed Norwegian kings. But it seems that he merely used them for his own political ambitions. This is perhaps why his historical work on that subject, Heimskringla, also seems ambivalent for scholars argue that it both celebrates and criticizes Norwegian kingship. But lest we descend into the rabbit hole that is historiography of Heimskringla, I'll leave us with this conclusion. Snorri was towing a fine line. His criticism, if any is truly present, is subtle enough to be denied among a Norwegian audience, but emphasized among an Icelandic one. After all, the scholar Theodore M. Anderson, who's rather big in the field, has argued that Heimskringla was written with both audiences in mind, though some scholars, such as Magnus Fjaldal, argue otherwise, of course. As I mentioned already, though, Snorri wasn't actually the only Icelander writing history and literature in Old Norse. In fact, we have several other sources that mention King Harald Fairhair from, from Iceland between the 12th and 13th centuries. And looking at those might help us better understand how Icelanders viewed their relationship with Norway. Ari Thorgilson, for example, who was the first Icelander to write vernacular history, that is history in Old Norse rather than Latin, in the 12th century, begins his work titled The Book of Icelanders with this line, quote, Iceland was first settled in Norway in the days of King Harald Fairhair, son of Halfdan the Black, at the time when Ivar, the son of Ragnar Lothbrok, had Saint Edmund, King of the Angles, killed. And that was 870 years after the birth of Christ." End quote. Although stated rather plainly by Ari, the connection between King Harald Fairhair and the settlement of Iceland clearly went beyond a matter of timing because over 15 sagas begin with stories of Icelanders' ancestors fleeing his tyranny. When looked at collectively then, Icelandic literature presents a founding story claiming that King Harald Fairhair was the primary reason that their families came to Iceland. And to provide an example of that, here's a quote from the first chapter of Ervigya saga. Quote, this was the this was at the time when King Harald Fairhair came to power in Norway. Because of hostilities, many distinguished men fled their ancestral lands in Norway, some east across the Kjolan Mountains and some west across the sea. 
end quote. And then even in another saga called Laxdala Saga, quote, during Kettle's later years, King Harald Fairhair grew so powerful in Norway that no petty king or other man of rank could thrive in Norway unless he had received his title from the king. When Kettle learned that the king had intended to offer him the same terms as others, namely to submit to his authority without receiving any compensation for his kinsmen who had been killed by the king's forces, he, ha he called a meeting of his kinsmen and addressed them. End quote. Needless to say, Kettle and his kinsmen decide to leave Norway. Despite what these sagas say, however, the reality is obviously more complex than that. But the point here is that Icelanders, who were responsible for writing down much of the Norse history and lore that we rely upon today, generally believed that their roots as a society laid in opposition to Norwegian kingship. The most telling example of this foundation story comes from Egil Saga, which was written in the 13th century and ironically, possibly written by none other than Snorri Sturluson, who was actually related to the characters in this saga through his wife's family and even lived at the same place where the saga's protagonist once did. But wait, how could he have written Heimskringla, which is ambivalent about Norwegian kingship, and Egil Saga, which is overtly opposed to and weary of Norwegian kingship. My guess is that Egil's saga was intended specifically for an Icelandic audience, whereas Heimskringla was, a mixed, was for a mixed audience, meaning that I side with Theodore M. Anderson on this one. They also belong to two different genres though, sagas about Icelanders and sagas about kings. If that is true, then, Egil Saga is a reflection of the attitudes and assumptions of a 13th century Icelandic audience. And since an author cannot be wholly removed from the experiences and expectations of their audience, this saga can tell us more about what an Icelandic authors may have assumed, remembered, and imagined about their homeland. That said, the main theme of Egil Saga is a historic struggle between independent farmers and overbearing kings. In the words of Bernard Scudder, who translated this saga into English, quote, it glorifies the powerful farmer who is ready to defend his honor and that of his family against anyone who seeks to diminish it, be it, be it a fellow countryman or a foreign king, end quote. Yet there is also a bitter acknowledgement that this was becoming a thing of the past. Quote, this picture of the proud chieftain may be all the more clearly presented because the author and his contemporaries were aware that such individuals were now becoming figures of the past. We can, we can detect in Egil Saga a certain nostalgia for the times when an Icelandic farmer was able to hold his own against powerful rulers in other countries." End quote. To better understand what Bernard Scudder means by this though, we need to consider the social con context behind this saga's production. The consolidation of power into fewer hands and the looming threat of Norwegian overlordship, which became a reality between 1262 and 1264. That was, that was the state of Iceland in the early 13th century. But before I get too carried away, I'll emphasize the relevance of yet another digression by saying that context is important to understanding every historical source. And so it is crucial to read every text, whenever possible, within its own history. To, sum to summarize it briefly then, even while Icelanders were producing a plethora of literature, which we rely upon now, it was drowning in a bloodbath of political and social turmoil. In the roughly 300 years between 960 and 1230, the amount of chieftains in Iceland went from 39 to either five or six, with most of this change taking place from 1200 onward. Snorri's own family, as I mentioned earlier, was the most prominent of those five or six aristocratic families. In 1220, amid this consolidation of power, the Norwegian crown made its first attempt to annex the country. For the king at that time, King Haakon the Elder, adopted the policy that Norway should hold all of the lands in the North Atlantic that were inhabited by Norse people. 
This was, you'll remember, when Snorri was in the country and made his promise to convince Icelanders to, to agree to such a policy peacefully. But instead, to gloss over much political mess, the Icelandic families in power violently fought over dominance and inheritance, leading to confusion and instability in Iceland. The Norwegian crown never gave up, though, and continued to push their expansionist agenda amid that chaos. The result of this history likely came after Egil Saga was written, but it was the Norwegian crown that won. For the Icelanders signed their independence away, more or less willingly, in 1262. While their reason for doing that is debated, I agree with those who argue that people were simply tired of the endless fights between oversized chieftains and their families. They hoped that a foreign king would bring them peace by removing the reason for those families to compete in the first place. It should make more sense then why Bernard, Bernard Scudder says that Egil Saga seems to long for the past when Icelandic farmers were independent from overbearing foreign kings for that was now a looming threat. Yet the final tone of the saga makes us pause to wonder because despite spending so much time rallying against Norwegian kingship and glorifying the independent Icelandic chieftain, this is what Bernard Scudder has to say about the saga's conclusion. Quote, Egil's grandson achieves his fame through fighting alongside a successful contender to the Norwegian throne rather than challenging the authority the farmer no longer gains his glory by opposing the king, but by supporting him." End quote. This is perhaps the saga's bitter acknowledgement that the old days were indeed behind them and that they must instead look forward and adapt. But I suppose all of that is enough, if not too much, to prepare everyone for hearing more about King Harold's life and reign, as well as how Norse culture actually migrated and changed as people flocked to Iceland. As we move forward in this talk, try to keep this complex relationship between Icelanders and Norwegians in mind, and remember that there is a significant gap in our sources in regards to time, place, and even purpose. But with that, I'll end my lengthy discussion of our historical sources and allow Joshua to speak about the man himself. Great, thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, providing some background there. Um, as a quick, uh, 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 prelude to our discussion about Harold Finehair, I thought it might be fun uh, if anybody has uh, either visited Norway or has family connections to Norway, um, uh, feel free to post where that is in the chat. Um, so either visit, maybe say the year you visited in the place, or if you have any family connections to Norway, feel free to post those in the chat as well, as I'll be talking about uh, some of the regions and you might just learn something new about uh, the area your family came from. So feel free to do that in the chat. That's just by typing into the chat box. Um, if you'd like to share that, uh, feel free. That would be fun and we'll take a look at those at the end. So thank you, Stephen, for setting the stage. I am going to get into the life and legacy of Harold fine hair, perhaps one of the most famous Norwegian kings and uh, uh, declared the first one by most historians. To set the stage, we need to consider what Viking Age Scandinavia looked like. Now, there is historic evidence from grave mound finds of trade and contact with the Scandinavian um, uh, tribes and petty kings with both the Gauls and the Germanic tribes as far back as like 400 AD. So there's definitely a cultural influence in Scandinavia from both the Gaulish and Germanic tribes. In fact, if you are familiar with the Germanic tribes, perhaps from your own studies or your interest in uh, the Roman conquest of the Germanic tribes, you might be familiar with the war god Wotan, who um, descends through some uh, uh, sort of cultural alterations to be the Old Norse uh, Odin, who's a distinct figure, but uh, can definitely trace a line to some more of those mainland figures. Um, another thing I need to emphasize before we get into Harold's uh, timeline here is that the Vikings, especially in popular portrayals, 
are often depicted as sort of a united force. This, um, you know, undefeatable, uh, tall, war-minded people who were um, sort of crushing a lot of the kingdoms along the coast of England, northern France, eventually all the way down into the Mediterranean. Um, this was not the case. And the map here shows uh, the petty kingdoms um, uh, around 860 AD. And so you can see Norway is not united at all. In fact, there is just a collection of petty kings along the coast, ruling small areas, and um, uh, and uh, sort of uh, warring back and forth in a manner that's similar to, that, uh, to what we'll see in Iceland later on. Uh, the Viking influence by this point in time, uh, mid-800s, was well known, especially in the UK and in Northern Europe. Uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, one of the... Uh, more famous Vikings, uh, famously depicted in Bernard Cornwall series, as well as the History Vikings series, um, had conducted many raids uh, across the ocean. And uh, just as a fun side fact, Lothbrok um, translates to hairy breeches or like hairy pants. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that was meant to inspire, but um, uh, either he had very hairy legs or perhaps he wore fur pants of some sort, but uh, uh, that's never mentioned in the Vikings history TV show, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a thing to scratch our heads at. Um, the influence of the Vikings can be seen in place names, uh, things ending in Ness, Vic, and Bo, uh, particularly in the UK and Scotland. The one that might come to mind for some people is Jorvik, um, which was situated in the Dane law, which by now had been uh, fairly well established from the influence and presence of Vikings on the east coast of the United Kingdom, uh, what we call the United Kingdom today. Um, and uh, uh, they were establishing similar systems, but there was not an organized force coming from Norway to do that. Uh, there were... Um, just raids by uh, sometimes individual ships, sometimes by petty kings, uh, and the whole situation was rather chaotic. The situation um, in each of the petty kingdoms, though, was fairly well structured. The petty king was at the top of the uh, sort of hierarchy. Below him were jarls and thanes that were given responsibilities that would have held land uh, and would have been responsible for supporting him in both defending his land and in conducting raids. There were freemen uh, who uh, worked as uh, farmers, fishermen. Uh, they may have joined in the raids. Uh, Vikings, though they're known for being fierce warriors, uh, were often also very avid farmers and fishermen and uh, quite skilled. If you've been to Norway, uh, uh, the farms there are challenging to say the least. A lot of them are built on the side of mountains. Um, right beside the sea, they're squeezed in on the fjords. They were used to farming in very challenging conditions. And this was also a motivating factor for them to go to other places that were easier to farm. And thralls also formed an important part of this society, and they were essentially slaves. And so uh, Vikings were avid slave traders. That was, um, especially in Ireland, uh, a lot of their wealth came from uh, the slave trade up the coast in the Mediterranean. And this was an important part, too. And so this was the established culture in Norway up to this time, about mid-800s. And uh, uh, it might sound like there wasn't a lot of structure, but uh, as we said, there, there was this sort of a societal hierarchy. There was also an interesting um, legal system called the thing, um, sometimes translated thing with an F or ting with a T. I have even see it with, seen it with a P, but I think that is a mistranslation of a Icelandic character. So um, the, the thing was basically an assembly of uh, freemen, jarls, and kings. Uh, men could come to the assembly, uh, women as well, uh, and present legal cases. There was a Norse law code, uh, which some people may be familiar with. We won't get too far into that, uh, but people were able to present their cases. The use of witnesses was important. And in fact, our modern day use of a jury in our legal system comes from some of the traditions that were a part of this thing. Uh, the Gula thing and the Frosted thing were things that happened in certain regions. And so these things would be typically annual or biannual events where the Vikings would gather and uh, uh, feast, um, sort of reassert their political allegiances and sort out these legal cases. So into this background, we're gonna introduce Halfdan the Black, who is Harold Feinherr's father. I don't think 
how often the black gets the credit he deserves because typically in a lot of popular literature um, and movies, Harold Finehair is sort of presented as this rogue who uh, bursts out onto the scene and conquers all of Norway in sort of one fell swoop. But his father, Halfdan the Black, was actually a petty king of the kingdom of Vestfold. And we'll get um, a bigger picture of the map here now. Vestfold, which is close to, includes modern day Oslo, um, which is the current capital of, of Norway. And he had done work, helped in the black throughout his entire life, building allegiances, uh, strategically marrying, raiding, and uh, uh, trying to forge alliances with other petty kings. And he really set the, the groundwork for Harold's later success. Um, Harold's mother was a daughter of a powerful man in Agder, which was south of Norway. So Harold had, at the beginning of his uh, uh, career pursuing kingship, uh, uh, tight ties to many different families in the different uh, petty kingdoms, which helped to sort of uh, uh, speed along the process of his uh, unification of Norway. So let's talk about Harold. First off, you might be asking why the name? Well, Harold Finehair, as it is typically translated, can also be translated as Harold Shockhead or Tangle Hair. And this all came down to an event in his youth with Princess Gita. Princess Gita was the daughter of Eric, who was the petty king of Hordaland. And you can see that here. Modern day Bergen sits in Hordaland, and it has always been an important area of Norway, um, uh, very influential. At one point in time, the seat of the king was in Hordaland after Harold's rule, though not while he was king. And uh, he asked her to marry him, and she refused, which was very embarrassing, as he was the son of a very powerful king of one of the most powerful petty kingdoms, um, and he was quite insulted. But she said she would marry him if he could conquer all of Norway. It was a tradition at these gatherings to uh, make oaths and to sort of boast about the things you were going to do. And so he made an oath to her and said, uh, I will take you up on that bet. I will conquer Norway. And to assert, you know, uh, my dedication to this task, I will not cut my hair until I have done so. And so for years, uh, he did not cut his hair. Apparently, he had quite the mane of head. That's what uh, the, the head of hair, that's what named him the, that's what earned him the name Shockhead and later Fine Hair, because after he won, I think people needed to um, respect him a little bit more. And uh, uh, that's where that came from. It's important to note that he did not start from that feast uh, and simply start conquering the kingdoms one by one. He already had family allegiances with many of the kings and jarls. Uh, however, his success was significant. He was um, uh, uh, successful in uh, defeating several of his key enemies. And in fact, the decisive battle, many historians say the Battle of Hafersfjord, um, which happened near Stavanger, that is uh, uh, down near um, uh, in the uh, region of Agder here, was actually led by Gita's father, um, King Eric, who did not want Harold to uh, succeed. He ended up succeeding, though, uh, in, in uniting Norway. We'll talk about some of the details of that. And the victory... Um, uh, is marked as a very important date in Norwegian history. This is a statue of Harold, which sits in Haugesund, and historians, um, many of them believe he was buried in Haugesund. It was erected in eight, uh, 1872, which was 1,000 years after his um, unification in, in Norway, which uh, uh, was that Battle of Hapersford, which happened in 872. Um, according to most historical sources. So uh, I'll invite you to later explore his family tree. It's quite impressive. Uh, all the Norwegian uh, monarchs and royalty can trace their line back to Harold Finehair. And he's considered the first king, uh, not because there weren't other petty kings in Norway, but because he united all of the petty kingdoms in his lifetime that were considered Norway. Uh, so his rule was despised by many uh, partly because of his uh, program of taxation. Uh, the other petty kings and jarls uh, balked at the idea of paying him such taxes, and many of them, as Stephen mentioned, uh, emigrated to Iceland. There were also challenges in um, some of the Viking settlements in uh, Ireland and in Scotland, particularly in Scotland and some of the islands uh, north of Scotland, which led to some Icelandic immigration. Some of the most famous Icelanders, including Auth the Deep-Minded, 
um, had connections to some of those conflicts um, moved there as well. But as Stephen said, a lot of these sagas are set in the context um, of Norwegians departing from Norway to Iceland to continue this life of um, chieftains, jarls, thralls, as they had done in Norway. And some of the interactions that happen between the Icelandic chieftains um, ring very similar to uh, the accounts of the struggles of petty kings before Harald's unification. Um, Harald had many sons. Some accounts say he had up to 20 sons, and they were notorious for fighting uh, uh, over the succession of his throne, none more than Eric Bloodaxe, who is said to have killed seven of his eight brothers. This is actually a coin from a funeral find. Um, this is uh, Eric Rex, uh, King Eric. This is from the reign of Eric Bloodaxe, which was not very long lived. Um, another one of his sons who ruled after Eric Bloodaxe's demise was Hakon the Good, and Hakon was actually fostered in an English court. And so he tried to Christianize Norway due to his upbringing in England. Um, that did not end up happening until a little bit later on, but um, uh, both of his sons uh, ended up being important figures in Norwegian history as well. So that is who Harald Feinherr is. And uh, uh, to give you more context on the uh, migration of Viking culture from Norway to Iceland, as Harald's rule brought a more sort of mainland Europe king style system to Norway. Uh, Stephen's going to dive a bit into Eagle Saga. Thank you for that. So now that Joshua has shared his overview of King Harald's rise to power and the diaspora of Norwegian landowners that fled him, I'll be taking us back to Egil Saga to highlight how Icelanders remembered him and their roots, for many of them were the descendants of those very landowners. But more importantly, they were the North's primary lore keepers, as far as written history and literature in Old Norse is concerned. So considering their perspective on the matter is all the more necessary. After all, sagas like this aren't merely fictions taking place in an invented past, but rather deeply rooted social memory highlighted by an author's creativity to make it resonate with the present for themselves and their audience. Like skalds from the Viking Age reciting oral poetry, these saga authors didn't invent history for fear that their audience would deem the memory of their ancestors dishonored. As a result, the passages from Egil Saga that I'm about to share reflect how Icelanders of the 13th century, at least, truly remembered the events surrounding King Harald's unification of Norway and their subsequent migration to Iceland. So without further rambling, the first passage I want to share comes just after King Harald subjugates several provinces, which are probably left unnamed lest we spend too much time consulting old maps, as fun as that is. A man named Solvi Chopper, however, escapes from one of those provinces and heads south to seek aid and muster the men in an attempt to resist King Harald's expansion. This is what he says, quote, Although this misfortune has befallen us now, it will not be very long before the same happens to you, because I think Harold will be here soon, once he has brought slavery and suffering to everyone he chooses in Northmoor and Romsdal. You will face the same choice we had. Either you defend your property and freedom by staking all the men you can muster, or follow the course taken by the people of Namdal, who voluntarily entered servitude and became Harold's slaves. My father felt it an honor to die nobly as king of his own realm, rather than become subservient to another king in his old age." End quote. The very beginning of this saga then, depicts King Harold as a tyrant whose rule brings slavery and suffering to everyone. Though it is clear that the saga author is referring specifically to land owning free men through Solvi, however, we see Icelanders remembered their ancestors as having only two options, to become a slave or to fight for the chance to remain free. This is perhaps an analogy for their own time, of course, when Icelandic farmers were threatened by dwindling independence, both by foreign kings and power-hungry chieftains. So this was not only a matter of the past, but a renewed concern for their own present. But regardless, it's clear that Icelanders valued their independence 
an idea that they inherited from their ancestors and a memory they continued to uphold in later literature. But to offer more about how Icelanders typically characterize King Harald, we'll turn to another passage. In this passage, we see how Icelanders remembered King Harald treating their landholding ancestors following their eventual defeat at his hands. This time, however, it is the saga author's own direct commentary rather than the words spoken by a saga character. Quote, once King Harald had taken over the kingdoms he had recently won, he kept a close watch on landholders and powerful farmers and everyone else he suspected would be likely to rebel and gave them the options of entering his service or leaving the country or a third choice of suffering hardship or paying with their lives. Some had their arms and legs maimed. In each province, King Harold took over all of the estates and all the land, habited or uninhabited, and even the sea and the lakes. All the farmers were made his tenants and everyone who worked the forest and dried salt or hunted on land or at sea was made to pay tribute to him. Many people fled the country to escape his tyranny." End quote. As direct commentary from the author, I choose to read this passage as a direct condemnation of King Harold's character and a victim's perspective on his accomplishments. Despite being written much later, it's clear that Icelanders were still bothered by the memory that many of their ancestors were threatened and forced to flee from their ancestral homes. Furthermore, since the saga author and much of their audience were likely land-holding farmers themselves, Ooh. it's likely that Icelanders felt resentment. Uh, sorry, Stephen, yeah. um, you just cut out for maybe like 20 seconds. Would you mind just uh, uh, popping back for a second and maybe going back two or three sentences? Sure thing, yeah. Okay, so I'll leave off right where I ended from the quote. So, as direct commentary from the author, I choose to read this passage as a direct condemnation of King Harold's character and a victim's perspective on his accomplishments. Despite being writ written much later, it's clear that Icelanders were still bothered by the memory that many of their ancestors were threatened and forced to flee from their ancestral homes. Furthermore, since the saga author and much of their audience were likely landholding farmers themselves, it's likely that Icelanders felt resentment towards anyone who threatened their way of life. And that could include the Norwegian kingship as a whole, which is being represented solely by its founder, King Harald Fairhair, here. Yet, even these Icelanders, as bitter as they were, acknowledged that the past, like the present, wasn't so simple because some of their ancestors were actually open to embracing this new order rather than fighting to preserve an old way of life. Consider this passage, which is spoken by Thorolf, the brother of Egil's father. Quote, I feel I will earn great honor from him. I'm determined to go and see the king and join him, for I know for a fact that there are nothing but men of valor among his followers. Joining their ranks sounds a very attractive proposition if they will take me. They live a much better life than anyone else in this country. And I'm told that the king is very generous to his men and no less liberal in granting advancement and power to people he thinks worthy of it. I've also heard about all the people who turn their backs on him and spurn his friendship and they never become great men. Some of them are forced to flee the country and others are made his tenants. It strikes me as odd for such a wise and ambitious man as you, father, not to be grateful to accept the honor of the king that the king has offered you." End quote. This speech must have resonated with contemporary Icelanders like Snorri, who actually sought favor from the Norwegian court themselves in their own lifetime. This passage thus uses the remembered past to speak more directly to the present, since Icelanders couldn't quite deny that there was indeed wealth and prestige still to be won in royal courts. Yet the saga author doesn't admit this without at least noting the dangers of serving the king as well. 
For the next few chapters recount Thorolf's struggle to serve King Harold without incurring his wrath. While I don't want to spoil too much about the saga, it's important that I at least mention that Thorolf gains too much prestige while serving King Harold, which arouses the king's suspicion and eventual enmity, which leads us to our next passage. When things don't go well for Thorolf, his entire family gets caught up in the fallout, mostly because they were honor bound and bold enough to avenge the king's treatment of Thorolf. Yet this land and this land's fa their family in the same exact position that Solvi Chopper described earlier in the saga to surrender, fight, or flee. And this is what they decide to do. Quote, Kvelduf and Skatlagrim discussed over and, and again what to do and were in complete agreement that they could not stay in the country any more than the other people who were engaged in disputes with the king. Their only alternative was to leave Norway and they were attracted by the idea of going to Iceland where they heard of the fine land that was available. Their friends and acquaintances, Ingolf Arnarsson and his companions had already gone to Iceland to claim land and settle there and had found land for the taking and were free to choose wherever they wanted to live. The outcome of their deliberations was to abandon their farm and leave their country." End quote. This wasn't, of course, their only option, but their Icelandic descendants had deemed that this was the only honorable option. Yet it was also a grim acceptance that one family fighting against King Harold alone would only result in their deaths, either literally or figuratively when applied to their way of life. Thus, while running away might seem like a cowardly thing to do, later Icelanders reasoned that fleeing was an honorable choice aimed at preserving their much valued independence as land owning farmers. And, I've said, and as I've said a few times already, our sources clearly show us that Icelanders were proud of their independence. And so it isn't surprising that their memory of historical events is colored by the fact that they inherited such independence from those ancestors who allegedly decided to flee from King Harold. This glorification of Icelandic independence, however, is made particularly clear when Thorolf's brother, Skatlagrim, arrives in Iceland. Quote, Skatlagrim was an industrious man. He always kept many men with him and gathered all the resources that were available for sustenance. Skatlagrim was a great shipbuilder, and there was no lack of driftwood west of Mirar. He had a farmstead built on Alftaunus and, and ran another farm there and rode out from there to catch fish and cull seals and gathered eggs, all of which were in great abundance. There was plenty of driftwood to take back to his farm. Whales beached too in great numbers and there was wildlife for the taking at this hunting outpost. The animals were not used to men and would never flee. He owned a third farm by the sea on the western part of Mirar. This was an even better place for driftwood, and he planted crops there and named them Akrar, which means fields." End quote. In other words, now that Skatlagrim was free from an overbearing king, he was able to flourish as an industrious man and build not just one successful farmstead, but three, not including the fourth that comes just after this passage. Yet the saga author also presents Iceland as if it was a paradise filled with bounty and opportunities for the land itself was prosperous in the king's absence. Have no, having low, no lack of driftwood, plenty of fish, many whales, numerous wildlife, and rich grazing lands for livestock, which the passage following this one tells us. This is clearly an idealization, since other sources, such as the Book of Settlements, include accounts of less fortunate experiences endured by hopeful settlers. Yet the intention here, perhaps, is to create a distinct contrast between the tumultuous life that Skatlagrim fled from in Norway and the idyllic life he finds in Iceland which was only threatened 
when his ancestors get too involved with the Norwegian kings that come after King Harold. It is thus immediately after establishing this sense of serenity in Iceland that the saga author reminds their audience what stands to threaten it, the animosity of kings. Quote, King Harold Fairhair confiscated all the lands left behind in Norway by Kveldulf and Skatlagrim, and any other possessions of theirs he could come by. He also searched for everyone who had been in league with Skatlagrim and his men, or had even been implicated with them, or had helped them in all their deeds they, they did before Skatlagrim left the country. The king's animosity towards Kveldulf and his sons grew so fierce that he hated all of their relatives or others close to them, or anyone he knew had been fairly close friends. He dealt out punishment to some of them, and many fled to seek sanctuary elsewhere in Norway or left the country completely. Oh. End quote. For the saga, this passage serves to foreshadow conflict to come between the sons of Skatlagrim and the Norwegian crown. But it also serves, then, to show that later Icelanders still worried that their independence and way of life could be threatened by a foreign king especially as the threat kept creeping into their contemporary politics. So for us, the lesson is this, that Icelanders used their memory of the past to create literature for the present. In doing so, they not only preserved their history, but gave it new life and relevance through each retelling. Yet this means that sources like Egil Saga, although born from real history, have more to say about the memory and concerns of the contemporaries who retold the story for their own lifetime. Thus, like I said before, the saga authors of later medieval Iceland were just like the scalds of the Viking Age, for they recorded the past with highlights of social commentary for the present. But it would be foolish to assume that prose writing ever replaced poetry altogether, for even Snorri himself, who may have written both Heimskringla and Egil Saga, was known as a scald and composed much poetry himself. So on that note, I'll hand things back over to Joshua, who's going to talk about the actual structure of Old Norse poetry. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, I know there's an interest in ancient languages here. I'm not sure if anybody has uh, undertaken a study of Old Norse. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, language, and I hope by this point in the presentation, you understand why uh, Iceland is sort of the center of the study of Old Norse and why the language was preserved there better than even in Norway or Denmark or Sweden, which are also typically thought of as Scandinavian countries. Um, but uh, uh, what we're talking about right now is Old Norse and not modern Icelandic. However, modern Icelandic bears a lot of similarities to Old Norse, and I have heard from uh, scholars such as Dr. Arngrimur Bidelin, who is working with us to create our Old Norse phrasebook that um, a lot of Icelanders can read these ancient texts and make sense of them. Whereas if you've ever studied Old English, even things back to the, uh, uh, you know, the 1600s are almost unreadable, unless you have some sort of background in deciphering um, uh, you know, spellings and, and such. My dad is a uh, PhD of English literature and religious studies uh, here in Canada, and he spent lots of his time trying to pick apart these, especially um, some of the early Irish literature. So um, there's an amazing sort of uh, uh, carrying on of the tradition, at least linguistically in, in Iceland, uh, not perfectly, but uh, fairly close. So as a quick introduction to um, Old Norse, um, uh, Old Norse was not as we would think of it, a written language. So they were not writing books in the times of the Vikings. Uh, they did carve rune stones, which are quite famous historical and archeological sites in places like Norway and Sweden and Iceland. But these were not really meant to be uh, history textbooks. They would mark an event, uh, maybe make a statement, um, and were typically carved in runes. So this is the, uh, 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 the Futhark, which was the uh, language of the Vikings. Um, Vikings tied poetry and language very closely to magic. And so uh, the runes were thought to have magical properties. And we'll see soon as well that poetry is also closely associated with magic. A few things that I need to mention about Old Norse poetry and the language it doesn't sound like poetry to us uh, in the modern day, unless you are maybe a, a scholar of poetry. We think of poetry perhaps as uh, sonnets or uh, maybe song lyrics even, where the emphasis is on end rhyme. 
And uh, so, uh, you know, as long as the uh, lines rhyme at the end, that, that sort of sounds poetical to us. Um, in uh, Old Norse, that wasn't the case. It was much more about alliteration and about internal rhyme. So uh, rhymes within the same line. And we'll get more into the features of that in a second. Um, one thing that really helped with this, especially when it came to the really, really rigid structures that the Viking scalds or poets used, was uh, the declision of nouns and pronouns. Now, you might say, I've not been to an English class for a while. I'm not sure what that means. That is okay. Uh, uh, in English, uh, declision only happens for pronouns. So, for example, there are different words. Uh, I could give the example of he and him. Whether the person you're talking about is the subject or the object, there is actually a different form of the word. So, for example, we could say he has a dog, and we know that he is the subject because that is the declension of that pronoun. But we would never say him has a dog. If we ever use the word him, we know we're describing the object. So, for example, we could say the dog bit him, and now we know that the male in question is the object of the sentence and no longer the subject. And uh, of course, we would also never say the dog bit he, that just doesn't sound right. Um, but that's an example of what we mean by declension of pronouns and uh, uh, nouns. This is really problematic when it comes to things like names because names are, uh, do not have, uh, they're not declining cases, which means that we actually have to use sentence uh, structure and word order in English in order to communicate who the subject and the object is. For example, if you say, um, Susie chases Henry, Susie is the subject, Henry is the object, and you know that Susie is running after Henry. If I flip the word order around and I say, Henry chases Susie, they actually change roles in the sentence, not because the word changed, but because the order of the words changed. So now uh, uh, the picture in our minds is Henry, the subject, chasing after Susie, the object. And this really restricts uh, people in English for writing poetry of the style that the Vikings wrote in because our mixing up the words ends up uh, changing the meaning of the sentence and flipping objects and subjects back and forth. That's a bit of a technical detail, but I wanted to give an example here. Uh, in Icelandic, it's not always this simple, but uh, as a simple uh, example of this scenario, um, we have this sentence, dvegir abau. Dvegir is the word for dwarf. A is the verb for to have or to possess. And bau is a ring. And so dvegir abau means the dwarf has a ring. We know that the dwarf is the subject uh, in this case uh, because of this ending with the R. And if the dwarf was not the subject, we would leave it off. So if we just said dwerk, we would know that we were talking about the dwarf as a object, like the word him. But because we said dweger, we know that he's the subject, like the word he. Uh, because the endings determine the subject and object, we have a lot more flexibility. So we could also say, about dvegir, and it still means the dwarf has a ring. And we can understand that because of the declension of the noun, dveg. We could also say baug a dvegir, and that means the same thing. Uh, even though we say, we would translate this literally as ring has the dwarf, in Old Norse, it would maintain its meaning as the dwarf has a ring. Last but not least, I mentioned that alliteration was really important, and that's the repetition of sounds um, at the beginning of words, uh, or at any point in the word in some cases. And Old Norse actually had slightly less phonetic diversity. There were literally fewer sounds, um, not significantly fewer sounds, but uh, 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 slightly, which made it a little bit easier for poets to alliterate. So uh, let's get into skaldic verse forms. Uh, as I said before, alliteration was a really important of, uh, aspect of Old Norse poetry. And this was also a feature of mainland Germanic poetry. So um, Germanic poetry featured alliteration. What made Old Norse poetry distinct and much more complex was the addition of internal rhymes. So within the lines, and I'll give an example here in a second, within the lines, there would be rhymes. Whereas we typically put the rhymes at the end of paired sentences, these would actually be inside the same one. And so there were um, uh, skothendings, which were half rhymes, 
And so skotenings means the consonant is the same, but the, um, the vowel is different. And so for example, we could uh, uh, take a look at this example I have here. The word red and wood are an example of skotening because uh, it ends in a D, but has a different vowel preceding it. So red and wood would be an example of this skotening. Then we had um, a dal hindingar, which are full rhymes, and that's what typically we would consider mostly uh, uh, in our own poetry things that rhyme. So light and bright, long and strong, they have the same vowel preceding the same combination of consonants, and that gives us the full rhyme. The example that I gave here is uh, something uh, I've created based off Peter Halberg's uh, book, which I've listened at the end, um, and some rules that uh, Snorri Sturluson describes uh, for uh, drakve, or court meter. Now, this was sort of the, the high poetry of the time and was uh, very challenging to construct back in the Viking times and is very challenging to study for a few reasons, not only because uh, it had some very, very strict rules. Um, in order to create some sort of uh, uh, experience that English speakers can have of what this might have sounded like, um, I had to ease up some of the rules because uh, 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 of the limitations of English, as we discussed before, and, and some of the features of Old Norse that make this sort of poetry easier to uh, uh, create. But I'll just walk you through what I've done here. So um, one feature of Durakvet is that there is alliteration, uh, typically twice in one line and once in the next line. So I've bolded the alliteration in these pairs of lines or staves as they would have been called in Old Norse poetry. And you can see that the alliteration is happening with L in the first two lines. It's also happening with L in the next two lines. It's happening with B and then it's happening with A. And so that's a strict rule that needs to be followed. Another one that needs to be followed is uh, the number of syllables. There are strictly going to be six syllables in each line here. And there was a syllable um, requirement for Drakvet, as well as for most of the other Old Norse poetry things. So you can see here there are six uh, syllables per line. I'll read it in a second so you can get a sense of the rhythm. Last but not least, every line had to have alternating skothening or half rhyme, and Adel Henningar or full rhyme. And so in this case, I've got half rhyme happening in all of the odd lined lines. So one, three, five, and um, uh, uh, sorry, half rhyme I'm having an even line. So two, four, six, and eight, and I'm having half, uh, full rhymes in lines one, three, five, and seven. And you can try to construct a verse of your own like this. It's a fun challenge if you're into languages and you are interested in poetry. It is very challenging though. Uh, that being said, I'll, I'll read this small passage to give you a sense, maybe somewhat of what this sort of poetry might have sounded like to a Viking ear. Now light logs to brighten, longhouse dim and gloomy. Let long flames grow stronger, like red wolves, wood looking. Bring here beer in barrels, fill every horn brim full. Also find wine and mead till throats are dry no more. There were other forms as well. Um, uh, uh, the meter of ancient words for uh, 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 for Nirdith Lag, that one is always a mouthful to say, uh, was uh, a common one and a little bit more flexible than Drotkvet. Drotkvet was one of the more complex and technical ones. Lothahatr uh, was the meter of chants. I love this one uh, uh, for chanting magic spells. We said that magic and poetry were strongly tied together. Uh, so Galdralag was the meter of magic spells. Spells had their own sort of meter. And uh, a common type of poem, this is not a verse form, but a type of poem was a drapa, which is a poem of praise. Uh, and there are many famous drapas. One is a Ragnar's drapa, which recounts the uh, feats of uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, mentioned at the beginning and famously portrayed in History's Vikings and uh, Bernard Cornwall's books. Um, Steeman had mentioned that uh, the events of these uh, uh, poems typically needed to have some real truth because they'd be spoken before the king, um, but were maybe uh, uh, biased, obviously, towards um, making the king happy and winning his favor. Um, last but not least, that uh, Eifidrapa was a specific type of verse too for uh, the dead, praising the dead and the deeds that they had uh, done during their life. So if you have any questions, like I said, we're going to have a Q&A at the end, but we'll have a little bit of an interactive thing here. Um, one thing that I didn't include in my example verse was a kenning. And a kenning was another feature of Old Norse poetry. 
that Snorri Sturluson describes um, when he describes uh, skaldic poetry. And this was a really interesting device used by Norse poets. Um, they were sort of illusions, they were sort of riddles, uh, and they typically alluded to either Viking culture or the Norse myths. And if you're familiar with the Norse myths, you'll have one leg up in trying to interpret these. Um, and if you do not know about Viking culture or Norse myths, these are almost like secret codes. And Stephen can probably attest to the, you know, the, the mind bending work that goes into trying to translate some of these verses and figure out what the hell these uh, uh, skalds meant by these different kennings. And I think based on my own readings of these, the skalds typically took some pleasure in uh, torturing their readers a little bit, trying to get them to figure out what the kennings meant. So I thought it would be kind of fun to try to interpret some basic kenning. So we'll do a basic kenning, then we'll do a double kenning and a triple kenning. The difference here being that a basic kenning is a single allusion to some sort of mythological or uh, um, cultural thing. A double kenning is a reference to a reference, and a triple kenning is a reference to a reference to a reference. So let's uh, let's try the first one. Feel free to turn your mics on if you'd like at this point and uh, uh, take some guesses. Um, who would like to guess? What do you think the uh, the kenning for Freya's tears is referring to? What do you think that's alluding to? And if there's something on the chat, maybe Stephen could just read the chat and call it out as I can't see that right now on my presentation screen. Any guesses for Freya's tears? A sorrow or a somebody's dying <laughs> yes good guess no not quite but good guess yeah you, you might think of sorrow but uh, yeah freya's tears anybody familiar with norse mythology know about freya and her tears i'll give it one more guess there gold from the chat Gold, thank you. Yes, so Freya was said uh, in the Norse myths to have cried tears of gold. So when the skald said Freya's tears, what they actually meant was gold. And the listener would have to interpret Freya's tears as gold. Great. Uh, let's try another one. How about the whale road? What do you think the, the whale road is a kenning for? Thanks again, Stephen, for keeping an eye on the chat. It's Ava. I was thinking the whale road might be their migration in uh, the waters. You're on the water, yeah, and specifically the ocean. The ocean is the whale road. So uh, the whale road is a kenning for the ocean. So instead of saying the ocean in their poem, they would say the whale road, and uh, listeners would understand they meant the ocean. They might say something like, Egil rode upon the whale road. And by that, they meant that he sailed across the ocean. Yeah. Uh, this next one was one that was brought to my attention by uh, scholar Emily Osborne, who uh, lives out near Vancouver Island. Uh, for me, she's got a PhD in Old Norse poetry, and I thought this was great. Jaw lightning. What do you think jaw lightning is accounting for? Any guesses there? It's Ava again. All I can think is my jaw j dropping something. Ah, yes, like, like, like shock. That would actually be yeah. a good, that would be a good one. Uh, it, it isn't what it refers to, but I can totally see that. Your jaw drops, right? Something shocking. Jaw lightning is actually a kenning for insults. So if oh, you insult somebody, you would say that, that jaw lightning. I thought that was great. And Stephen had already alluded to the fact that, you know, skulls had a lot of power in, in uh, either praising or insulting somebody. So jaw lightning is great. Um, are we brave enough to try some double kennings or do you want me to just uh, tell you what they mean? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so uh, let's try this one. What do you think the scalds mean by the venom of the battle snake? It might help to start with the battle snake. What do you think the battle snake is? That's the initial reference. It's a fall, right? I mean, or what do you think? Um, I don't know. What do you think the battle? Yeah, so, yeah, so what's the battle snake? From Robin S in the chat, gossip. Oh, good guess. But the battle snake is not gossip. No, that is a that is a very creative uh, interpretation. But no, the battle snake is a little more a little more concrete, a little more literal. Uh... I'll get us started on this one. The battle snake refers to a sword. So a sword is known as a battle snake. So what do you think the venom of the battle snake is? The sword striking, right? Sword striking, and what sort of liquid would be on a striking sword? Blood. Blood, yes. So the venom of the battle snake is a kenning for blood. And that is a double kenning because it's referring to the battle snake uh, in reference to its venom. Yeah. And skalds would be using... Oh, 
Yeah, <laughs> right. It's a, it's a mind bending task here. Uh, and uh, listeners would have to, and, and Kings especially, would have to be keen in interpreting these because if they couldn't interpret them, it would be seen as a sign of uh, sort of being uncultured or not very wise, um, not knowing the myths. Uh, this was really a way for scalds to flex their prestige. They're kind of fun to guess. They're like little riddles. Um, so the next one, the roof shingle of the Salmon's Hall. What do you think the roof shingle of the Salmon's Hall is? Any guess on the Salmon's Hall? Let's start with that. What do you think the Salmon's Hall is? I'm thinking it's a, I'm thinking it's the skin of the fish. Oh, good guess. Not quite. Uh, uh, the Salmon's Hall is more like where they dwell. Where do the salmon dwell? Oh. Cavens or some uh, underground cravens? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, close, close. Yeah, under, I'm not underground, but maybe underwater. So yeah, the underwater. Salmon's Hall could either be like a lake or a river. So if the Salmon's Hall is a kenning for a lake or a river, what do you think the roof shingle of the Salmon's Hall is then? The roof is the, the top of that, I guess, if they're on the top ground. The yeah, yeah well, the maybe water. on top of the water. Think Scandinavia, very northern. Is it their battleships or ships? <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Good guess. Not quite. No, no, not quite. Uh, but think northern Scandinavia, very cold. What do you think would be above the water in the salmon's iceberg? Hall? Somebody said iceberg. Ice, ice, exactly. Iceberg is perfect. Yeah. So roof shingle of the salmon's hall is ice. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, uh, humoring me on these. I'll uh, I'll talk you through the last two uh, before we wrap up on Kennings, and I'll pass it back to uh, uh, Stephen for one sort of final wrap up here, uh, our last topic. But uh, let's talk about this one: the bilge water of the war god's wine. This is a great example of how familiar you'd have to be with Norse myths to interpret this. So let's start with this, the war god's wine. First off, you need to know that the war god uh, is Odin and that Odin was in possession of something called the mead of poetry. Uh, and so the war god's wine refers to the mead of poetry. And there's a long story where he steals it from a giant who in turn stole it from dwarves, who in turn uh, created the mead of poetry by brewing it from uh, uh, this elven-like race known as the Vanir. They murdered one of their wisest people and brewed it from his blood. So there's this whole story behind the meat of poetry. And uh, we need to clue into that, that the war god's wine is the meat of poetry. And the bilge water of the war god's wine then becomes the bilge water of the meat of poetry. In other words, it's just the really crappy, not very good poetry made by people who are terrible poets. So the bilge water of the war god's wine uh, is something that a scald might say to um, uh, uh, another scald they don't really like or, or, or a young scald who hasn't really uh, uh, cut his teeth yet. Um, that's sort of an insult towards somebody's poetry, the bilge water of the war god's wine. Uh, by the way, if you learn these kennings, these are great for arguments. If you can throw one of these kenning insults at somebody, man, they sting, I tell you. Use your jaw lightning. Um, last but not least, uh, I, I'll talk through one triple kenning. Uh, Peter Halberg in his publication mentions that for modern scholars, uh, we know so little about Norse culture in the myths. Even what we know is such a fragment of sort of the full picture that would have been shared in the full oral tradition that uh, triple kennings are, are practically impossible. But uh, does anybody want to take a guess on the knives of the dirty faced deceivers of the wood bear of the old walls? Anybody? Anybody? This one had me. I, Emily Osborne had to explain this one to me. I, I had no idea. Steven, did you want to take a run at that one? Have you heard that one? I have not heard that one. I'm not okay. going for that. <laughs> this, one, this, one, this one's great. So, so we'll break it down piece by piece. This is a triple kenning. So the wood bear of the old walls. The wood bear of the old walls is a kenning for mice. Okay. The wood bear of the old walls. The dirty face deceiver of the wood bear of old walls. In other words, the dirty face deceiver of mice is, we can maybe guess that one. Who goes after mice? Cat. Cats, exactly. So the dirty face deceiver of the wood bear of old walls is a cat. And then what would the knives of that cat who's going after the mice be? The claws, right? The claws, exactly. So this entire kenning is uh, uh, basically uh, just referring to a cat's claws. And uh, cats were important in uh, uh, Norse mythology. They were uh, uh, famous as Freya, the goddess of war and of lust, um, had two cats that carried her chariot from place to place. So that's a quick introduction to Old Norse poetry. Uh, you probably know far more now about Old Norse poetry than you ever wanted to, and you have a few fun kennings to throw into a conversation.
Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Stephen one more time to talk about Snorri Sturluson and a bit of the uh, legacy of Icelandic scholarship, and then we'll wrap up here uh, with Q&A and any questions you might have. All right. So I've alluded to this a few times already, but Old Norse literature was the product of both the Viking Age oral tradition of poetry that Joshua just spoke of, and a flowering literary tradition that grew in medieval Iceland during the 12th and 13th centuries. As Preben Sorensen puts it, quote, the background to Old Norse literature, if we must reduce everything to a short formula, is the meeting between a living oral tradition and a society which needed and was able to turn this tradition into literature, end quote. So why did Icelanders feel that they needed to turn their poetry into written prose? The answer isn't exactly simple nor singular, but part of it can nevertheless be briefly stated. They were a migrant society that needed some way to retain their Norse identity despite being separated, but not isolated from their homeland. Of course, this began with the continued life of the Norse oral tradition in Iceland immediately after its settlement in King Harald Fairhair's day. But the written craft, which developed both from and alongside it, seems to have been begun by learned Icelanders, such as Ari Thorgelsen, as an attempt to create an Icelandic identity. As I mentioned before, it was Ari who was the first Icelander to write their history in their native tongue rather than Latin. It is possible then that the art of saga writing, inspired by early histories and narratives about saints, continued to flourish in part because Iceland craved to have their stories of its founding and its ancestors recorded in the same manner. It is thus that despite the animosity they seemed to show King Harald Fairhair in their collective memory, Icelanders became the lore keepers of the Norse world for they desperately clung to their cultural roots while also refashioning them with a distinctly Icelandic flavor. They used their Norse past to give meaning to and help define their Icelandic presence. present. In this way, it was because Iceland was a migrant country that it was so concerned with preserving its connections to the culture that it had been separated from. As a result, Icelanders were always keen to maintain their connections with Norway, even if they had a distaste for its kingship. As Lee M. Hollander wrote in his translation of Haim Springla, quote, In this connection, it is well to bear in mind that though separated from the motherland Norway by broad and stormy seas, for over 300 years, attachment to it never waned in Iceland. The language had scarcely changed Bonds of kinship in Norway were kept intact. Intellectual and commercial relations were never interrupted. Young Icelanders of birth in surprising numbers took passage to the old country to acquire a knowledge of the world and returned enriched with experience, incidentally having sold their cargoes of wool and homespun for good money and things not readily obtainable at home. They brought back with them news of changes abroad, news told and avidly listened to at meetings of the All Thing and the local assemblies." End quote. Thus, because Icelanders maintained their culture connections with the rest of the Norse world through both poetry and literature, they managed to preserve much that would have otherwise been lost. You might still wonder, though, why Norway itself didn't do more to preserve its own history and culture in written form for they did write as well. But the answer still lies in Iceland's existence as a, mig a migrant country. To put it simply, you typically only know the importance of something once it's gone. And Icelanders, having been separated from the very landscape of their ancestors and older oral tradition, would have known that feeling more than the Norwegians did themselves. So what exactly did they preserve then? Well, we've already talked extensively about how Icelandic authors recorded much of what we know about Harald Fairhair, albeit from a very Icelandic perspective. Yet, no matter what the intention or inevitable bias is in their work, we wouldn't be able to have such an in-depth conversation about King Harald and his effects on the Norse world without their sources. 
Moreover, thanks to the fact that those Icelanders wrote over a hundred sagas, we have a plethora of material to explore that, if studied and read carefully, reveals much about their culture and society. As Jesse Bayok puts it, quote, the sagas approach the type of ethnographic material collected by anthropologists in the field. In one way, the sagas may even have an advantage over the most, most ethnographic observations, which have a weak point. Because they cannot cover an adequate span, span of time, anthropological observations rarely captured the full range of variability that affected the community under study. The sagas do not have this problem. They capture a wide range of variability, offering deep insight into the mentality of the culture group as well as the changing environment." End quote. As a result, Icelandic sagas have been vital in providing us with an understanding of the daily lives and social structures of medieval Iceland, which were themselves derived from those inherited from Norway. Of course, these sources inevitably present several problems to historians, the foremost being that a historian cannot use a 13th century saga to accurately reflect the Viking Age past it claims to present. In general, these sagas have more to say about the society that produced them, but that doesn't mean that there are no historical truths embedded in them. For we know, thanks to archeological confirmation, that the events described in the saga of Eric the Red and the saga of Greenlanders, for example, which both recount the discovery of North America by Norse explorers 300 years or 500 years before Christopher Columbus, which um, this, that we know that this indeed did happen, although they might not have happened in the way that the sagas claim, and therein lies the distinction. Nevertheless, it was because these sagas preserved the memory of that feat that archaeologists, oh my goodness, <laughs> knew <laughs> what to look for and where to look for these Norse settlements in North America. And so they did. And they found them in Newfoundland around Launce de Meadows. You can actually visit this site today and it's, it's a world heritage site now. Yet so far, I've only mentioned history and sagas that involved Icelanders directly, but they did actually write about subjects with roots long predating the Viking age and the settlement of Iceland. Some of those sagas include the legends surrounding Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, Ragnar Lothbrok, which Joshua mentioned briefly, and King Hrolf Kraki, which involves characters who actually appear in Beowulf as well. It must also be said that Icelanders, most notably Snorri Sturluson, preserved much about what we know about Norse mythology. Despite their complexities due to time and place, without the prose Edda and the anonymously compiled poetic Edda, we'd have significantly, like, significantly less material to work with. At the end of the day, however, whether those legends are historically truthful or that, or that mythology accurately pagan, the preservation of that material by Icelandic authors has made much known about the Norse world that otherwise might have been lost to the relentless winds of time. And it's not only the scholars who have benefited from them either. For Joshua himself, as an author, attest to the profound influence that they have had on modern storytelling and imagination. Thus, the legacy of Icelandic authorship has been twofold. They have provided historians with much needed source material for better understanding Norse history and lore, and they have continued to inspire storytellers of today who continue to breathe new life into their old tradition. Thanks so much, Stephen. That's um, all the material we prepared for you today. Uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, uh, and Stephen and I have put together a list of further reading. If you are interested in uh, uh, pursuing uh, a little bit more uh, about any of the specific histories, so um, he suggested a few there. I am actually just going to update the slide. I'm just going to re-share this um, uh, because because I wanted to add a project that we're currently working on, um, or that's currently being released, uh, which is Old Norse for Modern Times. Uh, it is a humorous approach to the Old Norse language. Uh, you can learn it like a Viking, um, and it's being translated by, uh, or with support of Dr. Arne Grimmer Vilen, who's from the University of Iceland. And uh, Stephen has been a part of supporting the project, uh, and 
Uh, he's also suggested a few other ones here. I'll pass the slideshow on to Zach, and yeah. he can maybe share it out. The other thing uh, that we have to mention today is that uh, Stephen is launching a new website at the end of September. Stephen, do you want to tell us a bit about Jordan's Hall? Yeah, a uh, project I've been working on all summer is actually a continuation of a blog I started five years ago on the date of September 29th. And it's a place where I write and record videos that are of courses for Norse history, concise courses um, that cover much of Norse history. I'm doing a course on the Viking Age as well as medieval Iceland, and then a bunch of miniature courses on topics such as farming, healing, uh, including herbal medicine, Icelandic pilgrimage even, Snorri Sturluson, of course, and more than that as well. Um, it's currently $10 a month for, to access this material, but my I, the goal of this project is to give access to people who um, to quality information that's not overly priced because obviously universities aren't cheap and nor are academic books. Um, the one I included here in the further reading is $50, but that's actually cheap compared to some of the books. I wanted to include another one, but it was over $100 and hard to find, so I didn't find it worth including. So my goal with this is to offer um, relatively flexible options for people. So if you're curious to learn more about Norse stuff, um, consider giving it a subscription or giving it a try. Um, you can, if you want to keep up with the information about that, I'm basically on every social media platform. Just search Fjorns Hall and you'll probably find me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Joshua. And I uh, you know, appreciate Stephen. An incredible job. We all enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, and again, we will log into the website and you know, we check out the materials. Um, and absolutely, this was a very thorough um, and uh, very uh, understanding material. Like a, a lot of the scholars sometimes have a problem. And we, we went to a lot of New York, New York University, Columbia presentations, and they're either boring or they're just not, not interesting at all. But uh, we're all here amateur historians. And this was really up our alley because we're interested in poems. We're interested in languages. Um, we even have somebody here who has a PhD in Akkadian language. Uh, so yeah, uh, so we, we definitely uh, are interested in that. You know, we have our resident expert here, you know, Ralph, he's into languages and we do a lot of presentations on that as well. So this was like right, right up our alley. So I guess you guys want to open up for the Q&A? Or... Sure, yeah, I think I've got about 10 minutes, 15 minutes here. Stephen, do you have a few more minutes to do a Q&A? Yep, I'm good. Perfect. All right. And I just wanted to extend to thank you, Zach, for having us on. This is a super cool uh, opportunity. I enjoyed the, the Greek session. I'm hoping to pop in on future ones too. So uh, feel free to direct your questions to, oh, thanks so much, Robin. Uh, I'm glad you learned, uh, enjoyed learning about Kennings. Those are always fun. Thanks, Anne, as well. Uh, and uh, Mark there, I think. Um, thank you so much. Uh, oh, and there's some of the guesses too. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, direct them to Stephen or myself. Um, I'll duck underneath the table if you ask me, and I'm sure Stephen can provide you a uh, uh, there, there was a couple of questions on the chat. Mm -hmm. um, what is special or particularly different about Nordic poetry? And we went over it a little bit, but again, uh, just generalize it, I guess, in summary. I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate that if you're in... Yep. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. No, I think you answered that afterwards. I mean, I... I the, uh, so you're good with it, right, Marika? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. So her second question was, how do they keep control of people and land they conquered, like Iceland, for example? Um, so, okay. So medieval power generally wasn't very um, absolute. So at least for Iceland, after they accepted kingship, they had representatives come over from Norway and they would make sure that everything was still being kept in order. And they would also have chieftains in power that would talk directly to um, the kingship king back in Norway and introduce laws from Norway and make sure to enforce them. They're basically the king's sheriffs in Iceland, but they were Icelanders. Um, some offices, at least in the church, were only Norwegians. So Norwegians would come over and actually take over the leadership roles directly. Um, that was generally how they kept power, but Icelanders willingly went back to Norwegian rule. So it wasn't too hard for Norway to keep the power, but it was still very loose. It wouldn't be absolute control. Icelanders were more or less allowed to do what they wanted to continue to do. And that was part of the deal that they made as well. Yeah. I think another, 
important thing to mention there too, Stephen, that was great as well, is that a lot of people think of Norway as a very powerful country, but you have to remember that starting in 1200, Norway has been an occupied country for almost a thousand years. Like starting in 1200, it's bounced back and forth between Sweden and Denmark. It only achieved its independence at the beginning of the 1900s. And um, it uh, was also occupied by the Nazis in World War II. So um, Norway itself has not been uh, uh, extremely strong culturally it's kind of been in the shadow of other countries and iceland perhaps even more so because they were so far away uh and until sort of the renaissance of uh, germanic and, and norse uh culture interests that were brought up by the swedish royalty in the 1800s is sort of kind of trying to dig up art cultural artifacts uh iceland was seen as a very uh backwater and sort of like people living like animals kind of place not very important politically um uh at, at post viking age i don't know if you'd agree with me Stephen, but uh yeah. yeah, that was a that was an attitude Icelanders felt. And that's one reason why when romanticism was getting big in the 19th century, Icelanders looked to the sagas as a sign of like, look, we're not as backwards as you think. And look at the glory of our ancestors. And they kind of rallied behind that to seek independence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, uh, I have a very general question. And we'll go to Ralph. Ralph had a raised hand. Uh, general question is, there was a, a time where Iceland was prospering a little bit and then it disappeared. Um, it, there used to be, uh, I guess, the um, embassy in, in France or Frankia at the time from Iceland. And then it, there was no sign of, of anybody coming from Iceland into the mainland. And nobody knows what happened. Does it, do, do you guys have any kind of uh, insight into that? Sorry. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Oh, sorry. You no, know, you take that one. That's good. Yeah. It's a little bit of a complicated thing and somewhat beyond my period because I studied more of what happened leading up to the fall of the Commonwealth, but uh, Iceland, especially Icelandic historians will tell you that before they gave up their independence to Norway, it was kind of a golden age where they kind of had everything great. And then when they had to give up that independence, they kind of just became the forgotten province of Norway. And everyone started to forget about them and things started to go south uh, as a society because they weren't necessarily in charge of themselves. And um, they kind of just ended up becoming more isolated and they were dependent on Norway for trade and whatnot. So I think what happened really was that Iceland, rather than becoming that independent people who would send their chief or rich chieftains out to get educated, um, they started to be more of an inward looking society that kind of relied more on Norway. And then when Norway got swallowed up by Denmark, it just kept getting worse for them because that happened about 100 years, I think, after Norway actually took over Iceland. So Iceland kind of just became the football that they were kicking punting around like it's just this province that everyone couldn't afford to keep up and they kind of got the back end of everything yeah and i'll maybe add to that as well um following all those events to uh iceland specifically faced some uh, uh environmental challenges mm -hmm. part of the uh, uh issue with iceland and why it was not tenable um for many people in the long run was a uh, uh there was not a lot of uh, uh, uh trees to begin with and uh by uh, even after um a, a few uh, hundred uh, years of occupation, uh, Icelanders had cleared Iceland of all trees. So they completely deforested the island. And this led to a lot of issues, uh, both erosion, um, challenges for farmers and plants. They're trying to grow sheep, but there was not a lot to eat. And so um, there was that. There was also um, a temperature shift uh, globally. This was felt all over the world in the 13, 1400s, which um, uh, took Iceland from a fairly temperate uh, uh, place to live to um, quite hostile. And in fact, even more than the Icelanders it was the Greenlanders that felt this. There was a uh, thriving colony of Vikings in Greenland established by Eric the Red, who's a famous outlaw. And um, that shift in uh, climate, just by a few degrees, especially in that particular area of the world, made it uh, almost untenable. I think another challenge was that a lot of their economy, and Stephen might have more insight into this, was based off sea-based um, trades. So things like walrus ivory and uh, uh, whale oil, and once again, overfishing and just not proper management of those materials made them much harder to come by in uh, 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 the later years, 1200, 1300, to the point where Iceland, uh, I, I think at one point, politically at least, was almost non-existent to most people on uh, mainland Europe. Yeah, and on a note with your environmental part, it's like when the 14th century hit, it just kept getting worse all the way to 1600. And it's like, it was hard to recover because throughout the medieval period, like when it got settled to about 1260, when I was talking about them going to Norwegian kingship, it was up and down. So it would get better and then get worse and only get slightly better and then worse again. And slightly, it just kept, it got worse better quicker than it got better. 
And during that period of civil war that I mentioned a few times, it was actually a time when the weather was getting worse. So a lot of the political development, you can, there are actually historians that talk about how environment directly affects human events and how things, if the environment is getting worse, you can generally see that social and political concerns are getting worse. Um, I don't know any of the scholars off the top of my head, but I could probably share that with some of you guys at some point. Thank you. And uh, wait, it's a, it's go ahead. Can I one, have a one second. Let me just have Rolf okay. and then you can ask that question. Rolf, go ahead. All right, thanks, Zach. Uh, yeah, I, as you mentioned, sometimes these small emigrant communities are quite conservative culturally. To what extent can Icelanders today read the old sagas? Okay, so they can, oh, and sorry, Josh, do you want to no, take you, this? You go for it. No, that's great. Okay. So basically, when Icelanders really just see it as like Shakespearean English for us today. So an Icelander can read it and even understand it if you speak it, but you would just sound like you're speaking Shakespearean, like from an English person's perspective. But you can still read it. In fact, even when studying modern Icelandic, if you've studied Old Norse, it's a lot easier to get into the Icelandic because the grammar is still the same even today. I had a short quip I wanted to share on that too, because that's a great question, Ralph. It's sort of like this, uh, this, and Stephen had mentioned how, you know, these communities that leave almost preserve the culture better. So I went to Norway in 2015 to visit the town where my family's from, which is actually Haugesund, where uh, uh, Harold Finehair is buried. Um, so it's cool to see a statue. My, my great grandma moved from uh, the town there. Her family was fairly influential, some politicians, but she had married a, a, a poor guy. They decided to start farming in Northern Alberta and Canada. Um, but I asked some Somebody at one of the shops there. I was looking for traditional Norwegian rose modeling, which is a type of painting that my, my grandmother really likes. Um, and I went from shop to shop and I could not find this like very iconic sort of um, uh, uh, painting style, which is specific to um, that area of Norway. And uh, one of the shop owners, uh, when I asked him, said, you know what, you're not going to find that anywhere in town. And honestly, if you want the best, most authentic uh, Norwegian rosemelling, you should go to Minnesota because there's more people in Minnesota who claim to be Norwegian than there are people actually living in Norway. And the traditional, uh, you know, knitting, the traditional painting, the traditional music, uh, costumes, all of that is so much more well-preserved and celebrated in Minnesota than it is in Norway. Norway is sort of um, similar to Iceland, uh, kind of moved, moved along. Uh, their past is, is sort of buried. Uh, there wasn't that same sense of preservation. Interesting. We have, have a, have a go-ahead question. Yeah, my question is, I um, was thinking, was the Norwegians great uh, boat builders? Uh, and actually, uh, Joshua, you just said the Icelanders got rid of the wood. But so how did that work? Uh, were the uh, Norwegians building the boats and this was a, that's a great question, Ava. And uh, maybe I'll speak on that and Stephen can add to it. I'm actually doing some research right now for a new series on, uh, on pirates and I'm doing a lot of research into shipbuilding. And so I'm looking at like Mediterranean shipbuilding versus uh, uh, shipbuilding in Northern Europe. And yes, the Viking ships were um, for the time extremely advanced. It was a style called clinker built. Um, the, the planks rather than the Mediterranean planks would sort of line up clinker built. They would actually overlap a little bit. And uh, uh, the, the, the planks were actually able to on the high sea twist and turn a little bit, which gave the ships flexibility and uh, uh, allowed them to endure in some of the Northern seas. So yeah, the shipbuilding techniques of the Vikings were a huge factor. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. I know they're just updating the building, but it's incredible. It will change your life. Uh, they've got a few um, excavated Viking ships there. That'd be great. But to your question about the Icelanders, um, and Stephen can expand on this maybe. Uh, from my readings, lack of wood was one of the most uh, 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 devastating sort of like economic challenges that the Icelanders faced because the trees either had been cut down or were not growing fast enough to be replaced. So even things like headboards at the back of like your bed, um, mm. uh, people would kill each other over, over um, who got to inherit the headboard because wood was so... Oh. Uh, was so rare that uh, this this became a huge issue for the Icelanders, and as Stephen said, um, led to a sharp decline in Iceland uh, overall, especially into the 1200s, 1300s. Stephen, did you want to add to that? Yeah, in terms of uh, ships in Iceland, when the settlers first came, which would have been the late 9th century, um, they did obviously have ships that they had from Norway, and they brought over. They had to do it because they had uh, all their livestock in there as well, but as they ran out of wood so quickly, they ended up usually, they couldn't keep up the repairs of their ships. 
and they eventually used their ships they dismantled them to use them for other things like their houses or uh, other more practical things unless they needed small fishing boats that couldn't actually go sea uh, seafaring so basically because they couldn't have they didn't have enough wood to replace and fix their boats they just dismantled them and used them for other things and gradually they just weren't able to make ships like that and that's one reason why they relied on Norway for most of their trade and stuff because Norwegian ships were the only ones that could get to and from Iceland so they were basically in Norwegian hands in that sense. I've probably got time for one more question and I'm gonna have to leave uh, but if sure, you want to sure. continue the Q&A that's great but Zach you said you had a question as well? Uh, Greg you have a question or? or uh, Greg Edwin? Uh, yeah I, I'm actually one to refer to uh, that series Vikings that I, I loved uh, uh, you know uh, and in that ser in those series, they actually did migrate. They started uh, to populate Iceland. Uh, Loki, you remember? I don't know if you've seen the whole thing. You know, but the Loki supposedly had a vision, and he led a group of people. So, how realistic do you think uh, the representation in the series are? So there's um that so that series is it, it, there's a lot of great things I have to say about that series. There's a lot of things that don't make any sense to scholars. For example, in the TV series, um, Halfton the Black is pre uh, presented as Harold Finer's brother, but he's actually his father. So there's a bunch of sort of mixing up happening. Uh, the story focuses mostly on Ragnar Lothbrok and his sons, which were actual historical figures. Um, but the events that play out, um, they obviously, they got to make it work for TV. So um, many of the characters who have smaller roles are expanded. Um, other ones uh, who were fairly large figures are sort of shrunk or combined into two different characters. However, one of the first Icelanders to land um, on Iceland was a Icelander known as Raven Floki. And uh, he had been exploring uh, whether he'd been lost at sea or he was just going out. Uh, uh, but he, he uh, had brought his family. And he was, was he the first family? Uh, was, it, was it Raven Loki, the first one to land and settle in Iceland, Stephen? Or is it somebody else? He didn't, he didn't make the first permanent settlement, according to the sources. But he was among the first to actually go. Okay. And so there's some historical sort of credibility to that. They're drawing on the historical sources, but they're giving themselves some leeway for entertainment purposes. And I think they've created a really entertaining show that's uh, sparked people's interest in, in history and Vikings. So, so um, quick question. Uh, I mean, I love um, Scandinavia and I try to go every other year uh, and I love the TV shows and, and like, especially the, all the, um, you know, the, the, the authentic ones from, uh, Norway, Iceland, et cetera. So like occupied and, and Nobel, yeah. and, you know, just, there's all these, you know, kind of very uh, crime noir sort of Scandinavian noir type TV shows. If anybody's sort of interested, uh, you know, I can, I can send you a bunch cause you know, I, I sort of watch these, you know, ad nauseum. Uh, there's a new one. Well, not new, but it's like newish in the U S it's called borderliner. Um, and it's really good. I mean, it's just exceptional. Uh, they've only had one season and I think they're trying to have a second season. It's sort of like True Detective of Norway, if anyone knows who True Detective is in the U.S. Uh, um, but anyway, so uh, fantastic presentation. And actually, by the way, there's a, um, I assume you guys watch this, but there's a, probably the best political TV I've ever watched is Borgen. Uh, which came out about 10 years ago or so. It's three seasons and it's, it's basically this whole, um, you know, uh, like intrigue around a prime minister and, and, and their cabinet and coming to power and, and, and so on. So it's, it's, it, but it's just well made. It's almost like if you took um, House of Cards and West Wing, but you know, got rid of some of the like cheesier parts of it, you know, where it's just sort of, you know, they, they go so for, fourth wall all the time, um, you know, and, 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 and Borgen doesn't have that, right. It has more of yeah. that the grittiness. Um, so anyways, I, 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 I love, you, Aaron. love the TV. Yeah. It, it's awesome. So thank you. Aaron. I think Pretty Joshua much. needs to, needs to go. Uh, um, and I really, uh, um, yeah. Zach, if I believe is it going to end the meeting, do I have to pass control back to you or how does that work? Can no, you, you could just you could just leave it and it'll just pass it on to me. But Perfect. listen, I appreciate it. That was great. Uh, but you know, Stephen is going to be with us a little bit, or I need or to go you, as well. Sorry. Need to go. So, all right, all right. I'm 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 trying to uh, you know, <laughs> trying to take advantage of it. I'm sorry, guys. But uh, 
feel free to email us and uh, yeah. uh steven's got his website up too and so uh, uh yeah feel free to contact us we love to chat vikings and we're so glad to be here today and then um, let's talk about the, the next one where you were offering that there was a lady that she would like to do a presentation as well and you know yes. what it's it's always good to uh, adver advertisement wise i mean we can we, we're growing is our we have about 150 members and everybody loves this stuff so Thank you so much, your guest joining was ex exceptional presentation Thank and you. well prepared and you know very coherent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, and then if you guys want to stay around, so we, uh, uh, we can discuss our future schedules. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the other guys. All right, bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot, Joshua yeah. and Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. So uh, you know, um, I just want. How'd you guys like it? Um, was it good? Yeah, you can stop recording now. Okay. <laughs>